SJC 13139, Vass Holdings and Investment, LLC v. Commissioner of Revenue. Okay, Attorney Bowen, we're ready for you. Good morning, Chief Justice Budd, and may it please the court, Michael Bowen for the appellant, VAS Holdings and Investments, LLC. The one critical takeaway from today's argument is that the controlling legal authority of the U.S. Supreme Court and this court supports the appellant's position. The crux of this case is whether the due process and commerce clauses permit the Commonwealth to impose tax on capital gain income realized by VAS Holdings, a non-domiciliary corporation, on the sale of its ownership interest in Cloud5 LLC, a Massachusetts limited liability company. The good news for this court is that the path of disposition of this case has been predetermined. Controlling authority from the U.S. Supreme Court and this court instruct that the tax can be upheld only by a finding that VAS Holdings and Cloud5 were part of a unitary business. To make matters even easier for this court, the commissioner readily concedes that VAS Holdings and Cloud5 did not form a unitary business. So why are we here? We are here because the commissioner and its amici, the Multi-State Tax Commission, or MTC, have asked this court to join them in reading tea leaves. The commissioner of the MTC invite the court to wholly disregard controlling legal authority and adopt a new and unsanctioned constitutional test, that is, investee apportionment. This is so despite the fact that the Commonwealth does not have a statute or rule that supports the commissioner's theory of taxation. The court must decline the invitation of the commissioner and the MTC to read tea leaves. The arguments made by the commissioner and the MTC in support of a new theory of taxation are better suited for consideration by the US Supreme Court, not this court. There is no dispute between the parties that the general rule under both the due process and commerce clause is that a state must not tax value earned outside its borders. When a company is headquartered and operates a business solely in one state, there are no extraterritorial constitutional considerations. However, if the same company grows to become part of a multi-jurisdictional business, prickly constitutional questions arise regarding how much of the company's income is attributed or taxed in each state. The US Supreme Court recognized this issue and the concept of apportionment was born. The court has made clear, however, that a state is only permitted to apportion income in the context of a unitary business. As consistently explained by the US Supreme Court over several decades of decisions, the linchpin of apportionability is the unitary business principle. The focus of the unitary business principle is on the relationship between the non-resident taxpayer. Yes, Your Honor. Um, so given what you've just articulated over the past few minutes, how is it that New York approved the investee approach? That is why couldn't, regardless whether Massachusetts actually has authorized this, why couldn't Massachusetts adopt the New York approach? It will, it's a great question. In the New York cases and that are cited by the appellee, New York actually did have a law that directly provided for investee apportionment. And as far as the constitutional analysis went in, that ca in, the, in those cases, they took a different view of international harvester than we do in this case. And they applied their interpretation of international harvester to conclude that it was constitutional. And that, but I will tell you, Your Honor, that the New York reliance is of limited value because in 2015, New York repealed its investee apportionment rules. For constitutional reasons? I'm sorry? What did the repeal implicate its conclusion that investee approach was unconstitutional or was it um, sort of you know, it's just not good business to tax people uh, for their investee. That's an excellent question to which I do not know the answer. I just, I do know that as part of the corporate income tax reform in 2015, it was repealed. And there is, there are commentators who posit that it was repealed because of constitutional considerations. And that would, and, and I believe we cited those in our brief. Um, 
but yes, that, that, that is part of the equation. Councilor, can I follow up with a question with, so what about the, 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 the argument that VAS Holdings wasn't very profitable until the folks here in Massachusetts, the former Think Five and the folks that got ported into Cloud Five, that they were really the that they were really the linchpin to the profitability and the ultimate gain that we're all talking about here. Isn't that enough nexus with Massachusetts in order to support what the commissioner is trying to do here? I mean, your 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 fellows uh, realized significant gain after the folks here in Massachusetts streamlined uh, the the employee structure, got rid of some bad contracts. And then lo and behold, a couple of years later, there's a real profit here uh, that was really at the hands of the folks here in Massachusetts. What do you say to that? Your Honor, there's no question that there was an appreciation of value of the business post-merger. That's not the constitutional question. The constitutional question is who can tax that value? Well, part of the constitutional mm -hmm. question is based on whether or not there's a nexus with with the with the taxing state, right? I mean, so that's right. the point. So when you look at the fact that the folks here in Massachusetts were really the driving forces behind the gain that was ultimately realized, isn't that enough? It is not enough because the connection between the connection asserted by the commissioner is that between the Commonwealth and Cloud Five, but that's not the party subject to tax. The party subject to tax is VAS Holdings, a non-resident corporation. And that's a critical distinction. Under the unitary business principle, it requires that there, be, there actually be a connection between the non-resident and the taxing state. The commissioner's theory, which is unsupported by US Supreme Court authority or this court's authority, is that you only need to look to the in-state relationship to be able to tax the out-of-state gain. Can I ask then, are they, this is a taxable event, right? I mean, I'm not a tax lawyer, but that seems a basic proposition. It's a taxable event. So does that mean under your theory that Florida, um, who taxes, who, who has, who, who can tax if we can't tax? You're, and how much tax was assessed by the other state? Well, it's the latter question. I'm not sure. Well, let me answer it. Let me just go through your questions in order. The first yeah. question is, yes, if Massachusetts doesn't tax it, Again, this goes to the issue of sourcing, right? So at the end of the day, if it's not sourced to Massachusetts, the gain is sourced to the domicile of the, of the non-domiciliary taxpayer, in this case, Florida. But it doesn't have to be Florida. I mean, this, the, the issue in this case can come up in a lot of different circumstances. It could have been a non-domiciliary. But, but, but just, just, just help me out again, because I'd like to understand the practicalities. Because I take it we wouldn't be here if it's just Florida versus us. And it was the same tax. There's got to be something more going on. So I, I take it that it, can Florida assess this whole tax that we've assessed? Um, and is this a battle between Florida and Massachusetts? Or is this somehow some kind of tax concealment issue or tax avoidance issue that I don't understand yet? It's not a tax avoidance issue. I mean, Florida could tax it. Uh -huh. if it's, I mean, if it wanted to, it could tax it. So it's, like, fully, it's fully taxable then in Florida? It's not fully. There was no, the, the way that the tax worked, uh, Your Honor, is that VAS Holdings is a, was a Florida S corporation. Right. Right. And it had and Florida, the owner, but, it, but its shareholders, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just, I'm just, and I'm, and I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm just trying to clarify that, but its shareholders are also Florida residents, right? Not all of them. Not all of them. Okay. So, so. But again, you say it's perfectly permissible for Florida or the or where these residents live to tax that it's just Massachusetts is exceeding its authority. Is that your view? Correct. And in this case, the record evidence is that other states did in fact tax the gain. The same amount? Well, the record was how much did Massachusetts seek to charge in taxes and how much did the Florida? impose in taxes. Do we know that from this well, Florida, Florida does not impose a personal income tax. Okay, so there's no Florida personal income tax. Uh, so again, the, the, how much, go ahead, sorry, Justice Cox. Uh, no, I'm just trying to clarify. So the, 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 the tax goes to the shareholders. Were they in a state that paid income tax, they'd be taxed on that, correct? Correct. 
So a Massachusetts shareholder of Vass Holdings would have been taxed for the capital gains, correct? So would an Illinois shareholder. Right. But the full Megillah, the 37 million, not so much. Correct. But that's not relevant to the constitutional analysis, just Justice Gaziano. That's just the result of the of application of the rule of, of the unitary business principle in this case. No, I, I, I understand it. we're trying to get the landscape that just Kafka has that helpful question yeah. to give us that landscape. Yeah, see, because I'm trying to again, because Massachusetts, as Justice George points out, you know, has provided a regulatory system that enabled Cloud Five to succeed. Um, so we could tax Cloud Five, obviously, its income, right? Correct. Correct. Uh, and, and if it issued dividends, we could tax its dividends under International Harvester or whatever. Correct. That is. It's just this capital gains. Who has to? Who can tax the capital gains from this S corp, right? You, you bring up a very good point, Your Honor, and that's mm -hmm. that if if Massachusetts wanted to, it is completely within its right to tax Cloud Five, the LLC. It can impose an entity level tax with no question. Cloud Five operates in the state. It generates income within the state. It provides benefits and protections to Cloud Five. If it wanted to, it could tax Cloud Five. It could withhold tax on distributions to shareholders. Other states do that. Other states have a with dividend, dividend or distrib distributable income withholding tax, like International Harvester. Massachusetts does not. <laughs> this case deals with the taxation of capital gain, something that is triggered by a transaction that occurs outside the state by a non-resident shareholder. Can I ask you a follow-up of Justice Wendland's question? In that, is New York is the New York instance an outlier? Um, I know you don't agree with it. You said it was repealed for whatever reason, but it didn't go to SCOTUS. Is the New York case an outlier? Yes, I believe it is an outlier. And unfortunately, due to the passage of time, I'm not really sure why, but the New York decision, for example, an allied signal that's the, the core uh, case relied on by the commissioner in this case was never appealed to SCOTUS, even though allied signal prevailed in its protest of New Jersey assessment on the same income at SCOTUS. I'm not sure why Allied Signal did not appeal to the US Supreme Court. I wasn't a party to the action, didn't participate, none of that. But our view is that it is an outlier. Is that the only instance of, 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 of this principle being applied? No, Your Honor. In Ohio, the, the, the two states that had, I should say, one has, New York had, an investee apportionment law is Ohio. Ohio has a, a provision that directly a, a, would apply in this particular case. Unfortunately for the commissioner, in the case of Corrigan v. Testa, the Supreme Court of Ohio determined that the, as applied to the circumstances of that case, it was unconstitutional. And the, for, due, for due process, commerce caused reasons. And they took the exact same interpretation of the relevant law as we have in this case. So. But our point is, even in Ohio, where they expressly provide for investee apportionment, they found in the circumstances of this case that it was unconstitutional under the due process and commerce clause. <clears throat> so, Your Honor, the, the core of the department's position, or the, I'm sorry, the commissioner's position is reading tea leaves. And I mentioned that previously. And what I mean by tea leaves is that they grab onto the last three paragraphs of the Midwest VACO decision as providing them a lifeline for an investee apportionment. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, that was mere dicta. That has nothing to do with the holding of that case. And in fact, that case upholds unitary business principle firmly. But their position is that that, that is dicta and that opened the door. Now, as far as Massachusetts is concerned, we have law on the books that provides unitary business principle. And in this and in this court in General Mills in 2003, it faithfully upheld it. The MTC, however, has consistently banged the drum for investee apportionment. You know, dating back to the 80s, they filed amicus briefs in Asarco and Woolworth arguing for investee apportionment. In 1992, an allied signal to US Supreme Court, they argued for investee apportionment. In 2008, in Midwest FACO, they argued for investee apportionment. And 10 months ago, in the Noel Industries case that was on cert to the US Supreme Court, they also filed a brief arguing for investee apportionment. In each instance, the US Supreme Court has rejected 
the invitation to pursue investigative apportionment, even as an alternative theory, much less as a primary theory for taxation under the circumstances of this case. Your Honor, I'm going to leave with the, I what I began to with. Clarify that last statement. So the U.S. Supreme Court has declined to uh, approve investee apportionment. Is that what you're saying? My, my statement is that the MTC has advocated right. that the U.S. Supreme Court adopt investee apportionment. And my question is, the U.S. Supreme Court has not adopted it, but it also has not rejected it. Is that right? I think, Your Honor, and I, I see I'm running out of time. Do you mind if I finish my question or the answer to my question? No, I think we're okay. Go ahead. Okay. I think it, there are a couple of cases where they where they call the MTC out on its on its interpretation of investee apportionment and the unitary business principle, and my memory at this point uh, is, I believe it's a Sarko, where the where the U.S. Supreme Court notes that under the MTC's theory, that a non-resident would be deemed would be liable for tax merely on the appreciation of the value of the entity in which it is invested, meaning on the flow through of the appreciation of the value. And the US Supreme Court notes that that is too broad and of an interpretation of the, of the unitary business principle, much less an interpretation of the restrictions of the due process and commerce clause. Can, can I ask just a practice? I'm trying to understand if, if we adopt the opposite view, I take it your view is there's going to be chaos out there in the taxation. Give, give me some examples of what the negative consequences if we adopt the commissioner's approach here. I mean, if I if I buy stock in a Ohio corporation and I sell it at a gain, can Ohio now tax me for that capital gain? Um, it, will there be a fight between Ohio and Massachusetts in that example? I'm just trying to understand the practical consequences of what happens if we adopt the commissioner's view. Yeah, there are two primary negative consequences in my view. The first is what you've already raised. So if you're a Massachusetts resident and you own stock in Ford Motor Company, under the, under the commissioner's theory of taxation in this case, you as a Massachusetts resident on the sale of your stock in Ford Motor Company theoretically would owe tax in every jurisdiction in which Ford Motor Company does business. Because every jurisdiction in which Ford Motor Company does business would argue that they've somehow contributed to the appreciation of the stock that you just sold. I think the second consequence that's important to note is the coexistence, if you will, of investee apportionment states and unitary business states because of the diametrically opposed view of the relationships necessary to sustain tax for each one. Investee apportionment looks solely with respect to the, the relationship between the state and the in-state business. The unitary business principle looks at it completely different, looking at the relationship between the non-resident and the in-state business. So there are myriad different types of examples where there'd be states fighting over the same income merely because they're taking two philosophically different approaches to taxation based on the location of the taxing state and the non-resident. Any other questions? Great, thank you. Attorney Goldberg. You're on mute. Good morning, Brett Goldberg for the Commissioner of Revenue and may it please the court. The Supreme Court has said that Taxation is but a means for distributing the cost of government among those who enjoy the benefit of its laws. The constitutional analysis in this case starts with the bedrock rule that a state has the power to tax income of a non-resident derived from activities within the state. Mr. Because Trump, the state- I'm sorry to interrupt you so early in argument, but I will forget the hypothetical that your brother uh, just threw out about Ford Motor Company if I don't. Can you address that? If I invest in Ford Motor Company from Massachusetts, and I am I now going to be subject to all 50 states under your theory of taxation? 
No, Your Honor. Although, why, why not? What's the limiting principle? Uh, internet, uh, well, in, international harvester theoretically would permit that, but I think, but I think no state, including Massachusetts, uh, takes an investee apportionment approach to corporate stock only with respect to partnership interests. And the reasons for that, of course, is that a corporation is a separate taxable person, whereas a partnership is a flow through entity. Um, I think also that as a constitutional matter, a small stockholder in a corporation, in a publicly held corporation, could not be constitutionally subject to uh, tax it, 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 in, in a state simply because uh, the corporation itself was operating well, there. Why, why not? Because under your theory, the benefit is the one provided to the corporation that's value has gone up. You're saying that's where Massachusetts interest is. And why wouldn't that apply to partnerships and corporations alike? Why, I, I don't get why it's different. Well, it, Massachusetts just- I understand practically it would, in, chaos would ensue, but I, I'm just trying to understand legally why it's different. I don't think chaos would ensue, Your Honor. Uh, that in National Harvester case was decided in 1944, and there has not been a flood that's of states. A, that's a dividend case. That, that's different. That's an income type dividend. It's not a, I mean, people invest in stocks, you know, all everywhere. Um, and I just, and again, those corporations are benefited from your, the Massachusetts regulatory or the state's regu Michigan's regulatory environment for board. So I'm just, I don't understand. You, you need to help us here because that's frightening. We don't wanna create chaos here. So the, tell us why that's wrong. That's wrong because a, a small stockholder in a publicly traded corporation uh, would not under the due process clause be subject to tax in all those states because it wouldn't have a sufficient um, uh, connection with those states and wouldn't be on notice that it would be subject to tax in those states. Uh, a member of a partnership is on notice that it is subject to tax in the, in the states in which it does business. So um, it, 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 the this, this small shareholder uh, cannot be subject to tax under due process because it doesn't, it wouldn't have the minimum connections with uh, the states, a state simply because the corporation was doing business there. So what is the connection? What's the difference between the connection of the partnership here and the connection of a casual investor in Ford? Uh, a, a, partner, a partner in a partnership, first of all, there, there's two differences. One is the the in the hypothetical of the publicly traded corporation, the investor is a very small investor, um, uh, a, a one two percent, ten percent maybe. Um, but that so the constitutional principle would depend on the percentage ownership of Ford. For a very small owner, Your Honor, um, due process would bar a state from imposing a tax on a non resident uh, corporate shareholder because there would not be sufficient connection uh, between the the, the out-of-state shareholder and the taxing state in that instance. I'm sorry, would it be different for Elon Musk or uh, Jeff Bezos? It, it, if they owned 50% uh, if, if or 80% of their corporations, theoretically, yes. Uh, and uh, that, uh, but in fact, that is not the law in any state. So I, I, what, what it comes down to is, is in the first question that Justice Wenlin asked you is give us the limited principle. And so you're basically telling us, trust us, it, will, it won't apply to the little guy. It won't apply to the little guy under the constitution, your honor. Um, I think that is the limiting principle. Uh, states would be barred from taxing the little guy, because um, of uh, 
due process minimum connections required uh, in order to impose a tax. Where, but, um, where do you um, figure out where that line is for planning purposes? Well, uh, I, 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 could you ex explain the question a little more? I'm sorry. Well, okay, so the little guy's not gonna be taxed. The billionaires are. Everyone else needs to plan for taxes. The billionaires are not, aren't gonna be, aren't subject to tax, Your Honor, because no state in, imposes an investee apportionment regime on corporations. Um, and I think it would be very difficult, as I say, under the constitution, to do that. It's possible under International Harvester, but no state has done that and Massachusetts isn't doing that. But this, this isn't, again, this is an S corporation, right? It's a pass through. So are there a small partner, small shares in this S corporation? Um, little guys in, in the terminology we're using here, you know, people um, who I think there's uh, some 12 or 15 shareholders altogether, Your Honor. Uh, so, and some of them hold uh, smaller percentages down to- So, so, so take, take the smallest one in the record and talk us through how that person's connection to the state is. So the, there's, you say there are 12, who owns the least? And how much is it um, roughly? Does that person have any contact with Massachusetts? Um, they don't have any contact with Massachusetts other than through the partnership. But Vashi concedes that distributive share income derived from the partnership is taxable by Massachusetts. And that rule that imposes uh, investee apportionment on partnership distributive shares is not just Massachusetts, it's common among many states. Um, and uh, partnerships are different from corporations because they are flow through entities. And uh, there's, there's no debate that uh, a distributive share of income from a partnership is subject to uh, state tax where the partnership does business. Um, there's, there's no question about that. Vashi concedes that. It's arguing only that there's a capital a difference for capital gains uh, from distributive share income. And uh, the Supreme Court has said that there is no difference uh, in, uh, it, 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 it's the underlying, it's the underlying. But again, you're relying on International Harvester, which is a dividend. No, Your Honor. What else, what else are you relying on for that proposition? Then? Asarco and Allied Signal both say that uh, it, there, are, there, were, there were corporate cases, but, but it applies to distributive share income as well, that there is no difference constitutionally between uh, uh, dividends or distributive share income and capital gains. It is the underlying business activity that matters, not the form of the income derived from those activities. Um, and as I say, um, Vashi concedes in, in the distributive share context that it is subject to tax, that all its partners are subject to tax. And that is, that, that, that is I, I think, a, a, a universally accepted notion with respect to partnership taxation. Uh, corporations are different because they are not flow through entities. And uh, the the corporate shareholders uh, are not on notice that they are subject to tax in, uh, in all the states in which a corporation does interest. A partner, the partners in a partnership are on notice and do expect, and it is widely accepted that they are subject to tax in all the states in which a, a, a partnership does interest. Because um, in fact, um, if your uh, non-unitary partner in a partnership, um, Massachusetts and many other states uh, use a, an investee apportionment approach. That is, they apportion the income derived by the partner from the partnership uh, solely with reference to the partner's property, payroll, or sales. Why, why shouldn't we just rely on Florida 
um, to do this? Why are we extending ourselves into, what's the logic of that? Um, because these people, it is a Florida corporation. You both agree it's a taxable event, right? Of course. The only issue is who, who can tax it? Um, who, who pays the tax on the capital gain? And you know, it is a Florida corporation and they're Florida shareholders. Why aren't they the people who should be taxing this rather than us? Your Honor, uh, it's very clear under old uh, Supreme Court case law, Schaffer v. Carter, uh, Curry v. McCandless, that uh, states have uh, jurisdiction to tax based on uh, residence or source. And states and, and two states uh, can tax the same income, one based on resident uh, residence and one based on source. That's and Curry. You here you take 100% of the tax, right? You, Massachusetts seeks to impose 100% of it. Why is that? Explain to me the logic of that. Because uh, substantially all of Cloud Five's property and payroll uh, were located in Massachusetts. And yeah, but you, 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 I take it they pay income tax here. Uh, they pay their corporate income tax, whatever it is here, right? So you're taxing, it's, it's, you're taxing cloud five, Massachusetts is taxing cloud five in a variety of different ways, right? Um, cloud five is a partnership, not a corporation. So it is not subject to tax at the entity level. Um, the partners are subject to tax on their distributive shares of the uh, partnership's income. Uh, that tax though, uh, that distributive share income uh, that's passed through results in an increase in each partner's outside basis, which means that when it, that, and that reduces the capital gain that the partner gets on sale of the partnership interest. So there's, there's no double tax here. The tax right, that's- just, just again, I, I'm not a tax lawyer, nor have I ever wanted to be one. But so just tell me simply, how does Massachusetts tax Besides this tax, how does Massachusetts tax cloud nine or cloud five, excuse me? Mm -hmm. um, uh, cloud five is not taxed at all, your honor. Um, Vashi, the, uh, the, the non-resident investor is taxed on its distributive share and, uh, and th those taxes increase its outside basis, uh, which reduce its capital gain on sale uh, and Massachusetts does tax that the taxable portion of that capital gain on sale. I, I, understand, I understand we're fighting over the capital gains tax. Does Massachusetts tax this entity? Because I I'm completely persuaded by your point that we provide a benefit to Cloud Five. I get it. We provide a regulatory environment. Cloud Five is the source of this increased value. So Massachusetts has some ability to tax. I can't tell what they can and cannot tax. What else do they tax besides, if they don't get this, do we end up with nothing? Or are we taxing somehow here? Meaning if you can't get this capital gains tax, is Massachusetts out of luck and we get no revenue from, from this? Or is there multiple ways that Massachusetts is taxing this entity? Uh, Vashi is taxed on its distributive share, uh, and and we've collected that, um, uh, and Vashi doesn't dispute that. Um, the capital gain is a different matter, um, and uh, if if Massachusetts doesn't tax it, no state is going can to. Can you tax give it. me? Can you give give me a rough number of what the distributive share tax was here, uh, and versus what? is at stake here? For example, how much, do you have those numbers in the record anywhere? Um, yes, they are. Well, there's the, the, the notices of assessment, I think in the first volume of the record appendix. Um, so roughly, do you have a rough sense? Again, you know, we want Massachusetts to get the benefit of the regulation it provided. Um, the question is, are you getting other things of real value and you're seeking something that's novel and potentially problematic, or are you 
you know, get nothing unless you get this. So I'm just trying to get a rough sense of the answer to that question. I'm sorry, could you just ask that one more time? I wanna make sure I understand. Yeah, so uh, again, I'm persuaded that Massachusetts provides value to cloud five. Cloud five is the source of this increased value. Um, and therefore, Massachusetts should have some ability to tax cloud five. What I don't really get, and again, it may be my own ignorance, is what else you're taxing there and how that compares to the amount at stake here. You know, is Massachusetts getting its chunk of change out of uh, cloud five in a variety of other ways? We're, we're not taxing cloud five again, Your Honor. We're only taxing Avashi and its, and its shareholders. Uh, right. it, it, as a practical matter, uh, there was uh, there there were there was distributive share income, and in, I think uh, 2011 and 2012 there was none in 2013. Uh, it was a it was quite a small amount of distributive share income. So uh, we did tax that uh, at the corporate level and at the shareholder level at 5.25 um, percent, and I think 2.75 percent approximately. Um, but that was that was a very small amount because uh, Cloud Five didn't distribute very much income. It, it 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 did though increase tremendously in value, uh, as you know. And that that value that increase the real benefit uh, that uh, that Massachusetts uh, provided to Cloud Five would not be taxed if Massachusetts doesn't tax it here. Um, it, 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 it let me let me caveat that a little bit. It, it there 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 would be no tax at the entity level because other states in general don't impose an entity level tax on S corporations. We do if they're very large S corporations. Um, there there would be a tax for some of the shareholders on on the on their S corporation flow through capital gain income. But um, uh, given, if Mass given Massachusetts jurisdiction to tax as well, those states would give a credit to the shareholders for, um, uh, for the tax paid to Massachusetts. So there wouldn't be any double tax. And, and um, uh, uh, it, the, the cap some of the capital gain, I think some 30% of the capital gain because it would have been subject to tax in other states. Um, but uh, if if Massachusetts is is allowed to tax it, those states give credit for taxes paid to Massachusetts. Um, I I, I want to clear I, I want to clear up one point, which is this uh, question of Massachusetts authority uh, under the regulation uh, and statute to impose this tax. I I truly don't understand the assertion that that it's not clear because it is crystal clear in the regulation and the example quoted on page 59 of our brief from the regulation that uh, a non-unitary partner in a partnership uh, is subject to tax on its distributive share and on the capital gain on disposition of the partnership. There's just no question that uh, Massachusetts uh, is, is, uh, is permitted under its own regulations and statutes to impose the tax. That's why it wasn't really disputed at the appellate tax board. Um, your honors, as you recognize, Vashi. Uh, uh, Mr. Goldberg, so that isn't a really important point to me. And you said page 59 of your brief, but your, page, your, your brief is 58 pages long. Can you just read? <laughs> Sorry, I, maybe I misspoke. It's page yeah. 51. 51, okay, great, thank you. I'll just look at that. And, uh, and, and that, it, that example, Your Honor, is on all fours with our situation here. Uh, it describes a corporation that's domiciled outside Massachusetts uh, and uh, is not engaged in the unitary, uh, uh, in the non-resident partner is not engaged in the unitary business with the partnership. And uh, it's very clear that on disposition of that partnership interest, uh, uh, the non-resident is subject to tax uh, apportioned with reference to uh, the partnership's payroll property or sales. Um, your honors, the, 
Uh, Vashi here and its shareholders uh, gained great profit from uh, the extensive employees operations and property that Cloud5 had in Massachusetts. Uh, and there's nothing in the constitution that uh, 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 spares them the responsibility in common with other taxpayers of supporting the government under whose protection they have profited. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor.